Well, we have our last session for today, and we're looking at topic number 14, um, the Hajj and the Eucharist. The Hajj and the Eucharist. Now, the Hajj refers to the pilgrimage to Mecca. Remember that in, uh, in um, polytheistic Arabia, why they would take regular pilgrimages, the, the, the desert tribes, to Mecca and reaffirm uh, their covenants with each other. Uh, and, and remember, their gods were residing within the Kaaba, there at the Black Stone. So they would come to Mecca to reaffirm their covenants, these annual pilgrimages. And um, the region around Mecca was to be a region free from warfare. Because if the gods are living in peace, then we should live in peace with each other. And so what Muhammad did was to transform that pilgrimage within the polytheistic Arabian experience uh, into a Muslim experience now, where the Muslims take the annual pilgrimage to the Kaaba, not the polytheists, but the Muslims do. Only Muslims are invited to come into that region. Some 20 kilometers outside of Mecca, you see a sign saying, no, none Muslim may go beyond this sign. Although a friend of mine told me that he has recently been invited to Mecca <laughs> with 20 Christians. And uh, I've gotten a tentative invitation to go to Mecca from a Muslim authority living in Mecca. Whether that will happen, I don't know. But sometimes I think nowadays, with the modern pluralistic world in which we live, there is more opportunity for non-Muslims to go to Mecca, providing they are respectful of Muslim people and of Islam. Um, but the idea is that as you approach Mecca and the black stone there and the Kaaba, you need to be at peace. And uh, it should be a Muslim gathering uh, where Muslims meet and greet one another. Uh, Muslims take this very seriously. Um, a couple years ago, uh, I got a letter from one of my friends in Iraq, in Iran. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to go on the pilgrimage. I think he's taken the pilgrimage a number of times. I'm going on the pilgrimage again this year. And he said, um, we've been relating to each other in various ways. And I just want to say, if in any way I have offended you or acted unbecomingly towards you, I want you to forgive me and share with, share with me what that is because I want my heart to be completely free of any offense I may have done to anyone. I want to be at peace with everyone before I take the pilgrimage and approach the sacred temple, the Kaaba, in, uh, in, uh, in Mecca. Well, it reminded me of our church experience when we, do the, when we have the, the Lord's table, you know. Be sure that you're right with one another. If you're not right with one another, don't take the bread and the wine until you get right with your brother. <laughs> Be at peace with each other. It's very important. And uh, so this Muslim wanted, wanted to be sure that I had no, nothing against him. And I wrote and I said, you're completely free. You have treated me only kindly. <laughs> you have in no way ever offended me. Uh, we, we have a completely free relationship with each other, and thank you for your letter. I'm sure he wrote to many, many, many other people the same kind of letter. So the idea is that as you approach the Kaaba, is to be sure that your heart is free and clean without malice toward any. That's, that's a very important part of this, of this, of this sojourn to, the, um, to, to Mecca. This pilgrimage takes place annually during the Feast of, of um, Eid al-Adha, the Feast of Sacrifice. <clears throat> and it commemorates the fact that Islam is in continuity with the faith of Adam, who is the first prophet, and Muhammad, who is the second prophet, who is the middle prophet, I should say, not second prophet, the middle prophet, and uh, Muhammad, who is the final prophet. And we talked about that, that the, the pilgrimage commemorates the continuity of modern day Islam with the uh, prophets of old, including the first Muslim prophet, Adam. And the themes within the pilgrimage, and we talked about this before, so I won't dwell on this now, 
But the themes within the pilgrimage give special attention to the plight of Hagar and Ishmael when they left Abraham's home. That this experience of exclusion from the home of Abraham is reenacted every year in the pilgrimage. Oh my, may God help us to relate to Ishmael in a way that re-includes Ishmael. And at the height of the pilgrimage is this reenactment of the sacrifice where they believe it was Ishmael. As I said earlier, the Quran does not say so. It says the son of Abraham, but they believe it was Ishmael that Abraham was going to offer as a sacrifice to God. And God intervened by providing, as the Quran says, a tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. So right at the heart of the pilgrimage is this offering of hundreds of thousands of rams as commemorating that God saved the Muslim nation, you could say. Because <laughs> the Muslim nation comes to us through Abraham and Ishmael, they believe. Save the Muslim nation from destruction by the provision of a tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. That reference, if you're interested in it, is, is a Surah 37, a 107 in the Quran. This reference to the tremendous sacrifice that uh, was offered uh, as, uh, so that Ishmael may be redeemed. And all the pilgrims dress in the same way. Um, and uh, they come there to the Kaaba and the black stone within the Kaaba. They believe that this black stone is a sign of God's covenant with us. God sends his will down, Tanzil. In like manner, God sent this stone down. It's a meteorite, this stone down, you see. So it is a sign of the sent down will of God. And by taking this pilgrimage there to the black stone, one is commemorating God's will that he sent down and reaffirming commitment to living in, in harmony with that will that he sent down, a reaffirmation of the covenant. So let's look at some of the significant dimensions of this pilgrimage. First, every pilgrim returns home with a new name. For the men, it's Haji. For the women, it is Hajiya. You've been on the Hajj. So every Muslim would like to affix to his name, not reverend or doctor, Haji. Haji. I've been on the pilgrimage. And all pilgrims go to the same geographical center and worship the same in the same language and the same way. All in Arabic, same geographical center, a faith committed to place and language moving to that center. And all pilgrims are equal before God, for they all dress the same. No hierarchy of dress at all. All men and women equal before God. And the dress of the pilgrimage emulates, reinforces that, that reality. And the pilgrimage binds Muslims to the unchangeableness of Islam. The same faith and guidance revealed to Adam Abraham, and Muhammad. It's one solidarity that they commemorate on the pilgrimage. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, the pilgrimage also commemorates God's covenant with humankind in the trek to the black stone, which is a sign of God's covenant among us. As Christians, we break the bread and share the wine, commemorating Christ's death for us, the one who came from heaven, the manna from heaven, we eat the bread and the wine as symbols of this one who came from heaven. With Muslims, they don't eat bread and drink the wine, but they go to the black stone, which is a commemoration of the covenant that God sent down to them in the form of his will revealed in the Quran. Let's look now. I'd like to just compare this with the, with the Eucharist. <laughs> this has been growing on me over the years. I, uh, I, uh, I think it began growing on me some years ago when I was out in Colorado at a conference on Christian faith and Islam, bearing witness among Muslims, and Dudley Woodbury brought a sermon in which he talked about how as you approach Mecca, there is this big sign that says, no, none Muslim beyond this place. And how in Jesus, in his crucifixion for us, the curtain in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. It's opened up. <laughs> God's glory spills out into the world, as it were. And uh, so there is no barrier. There is simply welcome. Come to the table. He was preaching at a communion service. And uh, yes, there's no sign up saying, uh, 
uh, <laughs> you don't go beyond this place. There's a barrier here. Rather than what Jesus did on the cross, the curtain is torn in two, and we are all welcome to come into the presence of God. The exclusion that Ishmael experienced in the home of Abraham is, is no more, for in Jesus, all are welcome into the family of God, to full participation in fellowship communion with God. And so Christians regularly partake of the broken bread and the cup in their worship together, remembering the crucifixion of Jesus. And they gather for this Eucharistic meal in hundreds of thousands of congregations, worshiping in several thousand languages around the world. The huge diversity of it all, you know, but that gathering around the table of the Lord and that drinking of the, of, of, of the cup of the covenant, um, we practice it all over the world with great diversity. Um, but it's not a unity based on language or geographical center. It's not a unity based upon a pilgrimage to a place. It is rather a pilgrimage around Jesus. Wherever we gather in his name, there he stands in our midst, and we take the cup and the, and the, and the drink, remembering um, what he has done for us. So there's no cultural, language, or unity of worship pattern in the Eucharist, yet the meal unites Christians um, in grace and fellowship and joy. No language um, that unites us. And so the Eucharist is a time of confession of sin and receiving forgiveness of sins. I just love after the Eucharist when a, the pastor says, they don't always do this, but I love it when they do, hold up their hands in blessing and they say, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Jesus died for our sins. Your sins are forgiven. Go forth in peace into the world, serving the world as Jesus. But the proclamation is forgiveness of sins. And it's a commemoration of the Messiah's crucifixion and sacrificial death for our forgiveness and for our salvation. And it is a reminder that the Messiah will return again to bring to fulfillment his kingdom. It is looking forward with hope and expectation. We mentioned the other day that within the Muslim movement, uh, there is no forward movement, unless you would say that the expansion of the Dar al-Islam is forward movement. But history as such doesn't move forward. Islam comes from above, and we live within a parenthesis. And our responsibility is to simply submit to this law which has come down, this instruction has come down to us. But in the Christian movement, as we participate in the bread and the wine, Jesus says, we are commemorating his covenant, his sacrificial death for our sins, until he comes again, when we will eat together in the new kingdom. And so, the communion is a sign that the future is upon us, but will be fulfilled in the future. And so, it is a call to move forward, not live within a parenthesis, but a journey, a pilgrimage forward to that grand time when Jesus will return again. And that's why the communion service is a call for action, a call for movement, a call for saying yes to Jesus and all that he intends to do uh, within our society now, which is a sign of the future when he returns again. I remember some years ago, uh, I was um, in a mosque, and they were talking about the second coming of Jesus. And um, they asked me, what will it be like when Jesus comes back again? You know, Muslims say he will destroy all the pigs and kill all the, kill all the pigs and destroy all the crosses and convert everybody to Islam, that sort of thing. So they asked, what, what does the Bible say? Oh, I said, <laughs> the kingdom of God will be fulfilled when Jesus returns again. The kingdom that he inaugurated when he was with us on earth, that he proclaimed in the Nazareth sermon, you know, where he read the sight for the blind, good news for the poor. This kingdom that he, that he exemplified in everything he said and did, when he returns, it will be fulfilled. But I said, it's beginning now. He said, where? I said, come and visit our churches. You'll find in our churches the kingdom is already happening. Not in fullness, but it's already happening. For as Jesus did, we also serve the poor and food for the hungry, proclaiming forgiveness of sins to those who are guilt-ridden, casting out demons, families being healed and drug addicts redeemed, you know. Our churches are signs that, I said, even the cows that are cared for by the farmers in our congregations are very happy. 
<laughs> for they're treated kindly, you see. That the kingdom that will be fulfilled in the future is already happening now in our churches. Our churches are moving toward that grand future when Jesus comes back again. And brothers and sisters, the communion table is a commemoration, a remembrance that Jesus is coming back again and that the kingdom is happening now within our churches. And his life is touching us. Oh my, what a lovely thing to gather together in the communion table. So it's a reminder that the Messiah would turn again to bring to fulfillment his kingdom. It's a looking forward with hope and expectation. It is a celebration of the bonds of unity created through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the church. Just, Jesus said, just as I and the Father are one, so you also are called to be one. Wow. That the communion fellowship in the church is a taste of the fellowship and communion within the Trinity. And it's a commitment to go forth and serve as the Messiah served within our broken world. When Jesus rose from the dead and meets the disciples, he shows them the prints of the nails in his hands, and then he says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So this commission to go out into the world. So it's not just enjoying the forgiveness of sins for ourselves and the fellowship together, but now your commission to go out into the world to serve as Christ has served. And it's a joyful receiving of God's boundless grace in Christ Jesus our Lord, receiving his grace, his bountiful grace that is without measure. And it's a celebration of commitment to the Messiah who stands in the midst of the church wherever two or three meet in his name. And the Eucharist is a celebration of the gift of salvation, sins forgiven, adoption into the family of God as sons and daughters of God, abundant life now and eternally, living within the shalom of God and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, redemption and new life in Christ. All of that is bound up in the sharing of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And the Eucharist is an expression of worship, not as duty, not as duty, but as a right and joyous relationship with God through Christ and the joy of the Holy Spirit. It is the fellowship of breaking bread and eating together, participating in the fullness of life we have in Jesus, who is the bread of life. All of that in the pilgrimage to the Lord's table. <laughs> While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Do you see any echoes of that, any hints of this in the Muslim journey to Mecca? Is this a wild idea to suggest that the Eucharist in the church is uh, an invitation for Muslims to experience the fullness of grace that their journey to Mecca uh, is a yearning for? What do you think? <clears throat> What's that? Quite a big difference. Oh, a huge difference, yeah. It's a, it's a huge difference. But do you see any signs? Like this Ahmed Haile, this Ahmed Haile whose memoirs I'm writing, says, Islam prepared me for the gospel. Because the gospel fulfilled what, what, what I was yearning for in Islam. In the pilgrimage, do we see any yearnings? <laughs> any quest within that pilgrimage which is fulfilled in the Eucharist? Like what? Peace. What's that? For peace. Peace, absolutely. For peace. Yeah. For peace. Oh. What about the new name? You get a new name. It's the Hajj. 
When you go on the, on the pilgrimage, you get a new name. Is that a sign of what is fulfilled in Jesus? That when we meet Jesus, we become a new creation? David gets a new name, as it were. Revelation chapter 3 says he puts his name upon us. Any other signs that you see? Yearning? The yearning for covenant renewal. We're all equal brothers and sisters, you know. All of that is certainly fully fulfilled in the Eucharist. The renewal of the covenant, you see. But it's not a covenant based upon place and, and, and a sent down law. It's a covenant related to forgiveness of sins and salvation and becoming part of God's family and inclusion in his family, you see. It's, it's, it's a very different understanding of covenant that we have in, in the Eucharist. Let me just look at the concluding comments I have here in, in our outline, which pulls together what I'm asking right now. And then we want to turn to the Quran itself for a very interesting passage in the Quran. Both the Hajj and the Eucharist invite believers to come together in a pilgrimage. But the nature and meaning of the pilgrimage is very different. The Hajj is a commitment to submission to God's guidance sent down to prophets of the past at the Kaaba. The Hajj remembers that a ram was sacrificed as a substitute for Ishmael. The Eucharist, on the other hand, is a celebration of God's grace and forgiveness in Christ, who gave his life for our salvation. The Eucharist remembers that Christ is the Lamb of God, who took our place in the cross, and therefore we are redeemed from death. And as Christians, we invite Muslims to consider this question. Why did God provide a ram as a substitutionary sacrifice for son of Abraham? Isn't this a sign, an ayat? We believe that sacrifice is a sign pointing to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God who took our place on the cross. And there is a yearning for Eucharist within Islam, which is enshrined in Surah 75 called the Table Spread. Sort of five called the table spread. <laughs> Why the table spread? It is a yearning, I believe, for the Eucharist. It's a long chapter, but it's the concluding verses of this chapter. Five, twelve to fifteen. Listen to the Quran. The disciples of Jesus said, O oh Jesus, son of Mary, can your Lord send down to us a table set with viands from heaven? That means food from heaven. And Jesus said, Fear Allah if you have faith. They said, We only wish to eat thereof and satisfy our hearts. And to know that you have indeed told us the truth and that we ourselves may be witnesses to the miracle. And Jesus, son of Mary, said, O Allah, our Lord, send us from heaven a table set with viands, that there may be for us, for the first and the last of us, a solemn festival and a sign from you, and provide for our sustenance, for you are the best sustainer of our needs. And Allah said, I will send it down to you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Here, the concluding chapter, conclude, concluding verses of this surah in the Quran called Maida, the table, the table spread. The disciples of Jesus are saying, oh Jesus, is it possible for you to bring a table within our midst, that we may eat thereof. A table from God himself, that we may eat and be satisfied. And how does Jesus respond? It is provided. <laughs> it is provided. It is provided. Wow. Wow. This yearning within the soul of Islam. Oh God, provide the table. Jesus says, it is provided, it is provided. The Eucharistic meal is at hand. I am the bread of life. Eat of me, <laughs> my blood, the forgiveness of sins. Receive the forgiveness of sins. Receive the eternal bread. 
it is provided. It is provided. It is provided. And so we invite our Muslim friends, look at the table. Look at these verses in the Quran. Ah, good news. It's provided. It's provided. Comments? Muslim might say to you, you say that uh, the Christian Eucharist is open to everybody. The Christian what? A Eucharist okay. or Lord's Supper is open, but uh, we know that in, there are several different confessions with, with the Christianity, different uh, faiths, and they, some of them have open communion, some of them have closed communion, half-closed communion. You probably idealize, idealize the Christianity. Make it, try to, they say, Brother David, you probably try to present the Christianity in a good light, but it's not. Well, you know, I, I think, I think uh, we, one can have conversations about that. Uh, there's a, um, um, a Muslim I know who occasionally comes to church and he goes forward to take the communion. Um, now, I, I guess some churches would say he can't do that. I think it would be wise for the pastors to meet with him and explain what the communion is all about. I think it's important that he knows that. And in coming forward, what is he saying? What is he doing? Is he committing himself to Christ? Those sorts of questions must be looked at, certainly. Um, it would seem to me that as those questions open up, uh, we would remind our Muslim friends that as you go on the Hajj, you seek to be cleansed of any malice, anything wrong within your life. And as we come to the table of the Lord, we must be sure that our lives are pure and clean and that we are forgiven. And it's in Jesus we have that forgiveness of sins. And that's why with boldness we approach the communion. And so welcome, welcome to the table. And let the Holy Spirit uh, uh, search your heart and life um, in terms of faith questions and so forth. Are you, are you ready to receive this table? So each church needs to find a way to work at that, I know. But uh, certainly, the outstretched arms of Jesus are a proclamation. I wish to forgive your sins. I invite you to reconciliation. And the Eucharistic meal is a, is a, is a um, ongoing commemoration of that invitation from God in Jesus, be reconciled. Welcome to my reconciling embrace. God in Jesus comes to us with open arms welcoming arms, arms that seek to be embraced. You know, if I come to you like this, what does it mean? Could you just come up here for a moment? If I come to you like this, what does it mean? Be careful, be careful. No, no. What if I come to you like this, I say God is great. I'm ready to fight for God, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be careful, be careful, be careful. <laughs> you take a step back, exactly right. Yeah. What if I come to you like this, which is the Buddhist, the Buddhist figures like this or like this, something like that, they like this. Buddha never has his arms out like this. Yeah, yeah, that's right, or like this. The Buddha figure like this. Yeah, the Buddha figure may be like that or like this, it means I'm close to you. And that's the Buddhist theology. You're, you are on your own. There's no salvation coming from anybody outside of you. You're your own savior. Like this, like this. What if I come to you like this? I want to embrace you. I'll pull no weapon. This is vulnerable. This is total vulnerability. I'll pull no weapon on you. <laughs> I will seek to embrace you. I welcome you. Come, you see? <laughs> One time I was in a large mosque and having a dialogue with the Muslim, and he says, what about this thing of redemption? What's all that about? So I walked over to him. I said, this is what it is. It's God in Christ coming to embrace you, saying, come, be reconciled. I will redeem you. <laughs> that's what it is, you see. And that's the gospel message. And that's the Eucharistic meal. It is a fellowship of welcome. Come, experience and receive the embrace of God. That's the gospel. Amen. Thank you.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.